You know, we all know that the Federal Reserve has created these these massive bubbles in fiat money assets all over the place. And we can also see the insanity in these bifurcated markets. Definitely a higher division between the haves and the have-nots. Finally, we also know about the global retirement crisis that we're already walking through. So the big question is, how secure is your retirement? In today's video, I'm going to show you some recent changes that, frankly, just add more risk and risk transfer. But I'm also going to show you what you can do to protect your wealth and your future. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service physical gold and silver company. And you know, we specialize in strategies, but never has that been more important than today, of all days, because our future is in jeopardy. And if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And now, again, Experts are sounding the warning bell. This is part two of what I started the other day. I wanted to dig into this debt issue and the change in the laws more deeply because you really need to know what's going on. How many times can you be lied to if you do not know the truth? My favorite question. So the Federal Reserve, I love this debates tougher regulation to prevent asset bubbles that they created with their zero interest rate policy. I don't know. Hmm. That's the Case-Shiller National Home Price Index. And I know it might be a little different over here, like New York City or San Francisco. But I, I don't know. That looks like a bubble to me, especially since it was never allowed to express to its bottom after the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. And, oh, I don't know, this is the S&P 500 versus, you know, you've seen this graph a lot if you've looked at my work, versus the federal and the central bank, key central bank's balance sheet. And uh, I don't know, you think this might create a bubble? And after all, we also know that the markets go up when there is talk of more stimulus, this is who they are stimulating. We can see it. It's pretty obvious. And the biggest bubble, I can't say of all because honestly, it's the derivatives that are. And by the way, still no word on that auction, which makes me very nervous. I got to tell you, why not just say the results? Mm, no big black hole of nothing does not mean it didn't happen just means that they don't want us to know the results so i'm guessing it was not great but this is public debt and you know look at this bubble i mean come on give me a break we're going to make regulations tougher to prevent these bubbles too late but you can do more regulations Wait until you see what I have and what they have in mind for additional regulations. Because we know that we've been in a massive de state of deregulation. All the regulations that went on, adding pr investor protections in the Dodd-Frank Act, including the bail-in that added protections for the bank's ability to survive a run, which we saw tested in March. But... You know, how is this going to not just affect your retirement, but how is it going to, ref to affect your future? And for me, quite honestly, more importantly, my children's future, my grandchildren's future, and your children's future. Let's just start. Because honestly, it's been set up. 
And look at this, back in June, which I've actually been wanting to talk about. So I'm really glad that I could put it in here because you need to see this setup. The U.S. private ec clears private equity as investment option for retirement plans. Now they're saying because, oh, just superior performance, although the truth is, is the performance is not superior. The fees are superior and it's opacity. Your ability to see what they're doing is also superior, meaning not, you can't see anything. But the Department of Labor now allows private equity investments to be offered to U.S. retirement plan because, hey, the average guy working out there funding the retirement plan, they're sure sophisticated. They sure understand all of the garbage. Just wait. But employee-sponsored defined benefit plans such as the pension funds of public sector workers have long been allowed to include buyout funds in their investment portfolios. This is actually since the late 70s, turning private equity into a multi-trillion dollar industry. Let's think about that for a minute because we've talked about this before. And those employee-sponsored defined benefit, which means this is how much you're going to get in retirement. So they're defining the benefit. A 401k is a defined contribution. This is how much you're going to put in, but who knows what you're going to get at the end of it. But defined benefit plans have been putting money into private equity and really certainly help boost it. But can you please explain to me why single employer as well as multi-employer plans are running out of money and are severely underfunded if we've had such superior performance. But hey, who cares about the facts? Duh, let's just let those 401k, all that money go into those 401ks. What a good idea. And I hope you realize I'm being completely facetious because they just see all those trillions in there and they want to get their hands on it. And I'm going to show you why they want to get their hands on it in a couple of minutes. Bear with me here. But the private equity part of private markets are some of the riskiest investments with extremely high leverage and very high fees. So that's one reason why they want to get their hands on it. Wait till I show you more. But the truth is that private equity performance and returns have been one of the poor, have been poor at best. So like, duh, this is why we can see even in the pension plans, employee sponsored from single corporations or multi-corporations. Multi-corporations would be like teachers unions, would also be, uh, you know, construction unions, unions, you know, so it can be different companies in all over the country. Although, as we've seen previously, they're now allowing dissimilar companies to pull together. Great idea, um, but not for you or me. Not a good idea for you or me. Because this is a tool to transfer risk from the few, from the guys that run this, from the guys that are up at the top, down to the bottom, to the many. Because we've, hey, if you ever recognized it by now, it should be really painfully clear through what's been happening with the COVID pandemic, that those at the top and those corporations are way too important to fail. Whereas we down at the bottom, we little guys, even though our families would probably disagree with this, we're just about the right size to fail because what are we going to do? We know a lot of corporations that have a lot more money than governments have, and they use that money for lobbying and for other things. But I don't, that's a topic for another day. I love this one. Private equity owners pile on leverage to pay themselves dividends. So what are they doing with all of that money? Hmm. Dividend recapitalization. And look at how much that's grown just in this last quarter. 
So far in September, almost 24% of money raised in the U.S. loan market, that's the private equity market, has been used to fund dividends. So they take that money in and then, whoop, that money goes to the owners. Not to you or me, not to the investors, but the owners, the legal owners, which you and I are not. I've shown you over and over and over again that you are merely classified. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. And you are merely classified as a beneficial owner. What's your benefit? Well, your benefit in this case is when they go under. I mean, look at Neiman Marcus. Look at J.C. Penney. Right? You remember the corporate raiders in the 80s? They'd go in, strip all the value out of a corporation, break it into pieces. Who won? Not the workers, not the little guys, not the little investors. And this is no different. So I got to ask you, because they say, if private equity sponsors can take money off the table, then they're going to do it. There is going to be more coming for sure because in this low interest rate environment that the Federal Reserve and other global central banks have created of their own making to force us into what's called financial repression. That's their term, not mine. And what it means is when you push interest rates all the way down to zero or even lower than the rest of the market, then people that are trying to save have to take more risk. Why do you think the stock market's where it is? This is multiple expansion. This is not true value. This is not that they're earning more money because everything is so great. It's because of the manipulations of the global central banks. And they became overt in 2008 when they came out and didn't even hide the fact. I mean, it's mind blowing to me that anybody looks at these markets and can think that they're real and that they're such a good thing and that that's where they want to hold their wealth because they overtly talked about managing the markets. And guess what? They've managed us into a ditch. And I believe that that is on purpose because they are out of tools. They are out of ammunition, absolutely out of it. And so there's another product that they're promoting, private equity, which you can now invest in through retirement plans and Pension plan's been doing it for a while. Risky pick deals pitched by private equity to yield hungry investors. Take more risk, we'll pay you 5% or even 7%. Woohoo! You are not getting paid to take the risk that you're taking. Private equity firms are testing investors' appetite for returns with new sales of payment in kind. That's pick payment in kind bonds that offer juicy interest rates but are among the riskiest deals since the covid crisis began okay listen to this this is an anatomy of a pick deal and you know if you knew this would you actually buy it i'm going to tell you guys if you are sitting in fiat money products you need to start reading the contracts and what you agreed to you can do it online you can even do a control F and search keywords. You have to read all of this little teeny fine print that they create so that your eyes glaze over and you go, oh no, no. Oh, I'm sure my broker just told me all, everything that I needed to know. Uh, well, we'll come back to that in a minute, but let me go back to this. Cause I, I, I mean, honestly, you know, I went apoplectic when I saw this. So in a pick bond, they can defer interest payments until the end. And they can add that to the principal compounding the debt. So however much that original issue is, at the end of the life of the bond, it's going to be a whole lot bigger, a whole lot more that's going to be owed. 
Now, typically, it's debtors that are deeply distressed who need this extra cash to survive. So they can't pay you interest. The question is, will they survive? I don't know. I don't know. But are you willing to take that risk? Because I'm thinking you were probably worked pretty hard for your fiat money. Are you willing to take that risk? At greater risk of being wiped out in bankruptcy. These go to the end of the line. We talked more about that last week. Well, remember, derivatives go to the front of the line and then the new debt that gets issued goes behind them. Any that's out there is at the back of the line and these are certainly, we they're not called bail inable bonds, but they're bail inable bonds. PK toggle deals allow issuers to switch between paying the coupons and paying in kind. In other words, taking that interest and putting it in the debt and then compounding that debt. But considering the fact that these are typically companies that need this cash to survive, what do you think they're choosing to do? But many think, and I would agree with this, that's why when everybody's looking for when, it is a sign of a frothy market. These markets are so ridiculously overvalued. I don't even know how to talk about them because they're only going up because of all of the money, the new money that the central banks are pushing in there. You saw the charts. You can go to Yardeni. That's one of my, you know, I always pull that chart from him. He does an update probably about daily or weekly anyway, you can go in there. You've got the links. You'll find them in the blog. Private equity owners have used these borrowings to fund payouts. Their portfolio companies are the ones that are issuing these bonds. So not only are these really, really risky companies to begin with that need the cash to survive, but there's a part of it that goes out. Okay, wait. Let's see. First of all, investors plowed $12.2 billion into these ETFs. But the reemergence of PICS underscores how fixed income investors are increasingly being asked to accept higher degrees of risk and more onerous terms from corporate bond issuers as soaring prices, I love this one, of higher quality assets, meaning government bonds, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so here's an example. Cloud computing company ECI Software, owned by Apex Partners Private Equity, is set to raise $740 million in new loans, earmarking $118 million to fund a dividend to its owner, according to S&P Global Ratings. It follows on the heels of snack maker Sharer Foods, owned by Chicago-based private equity company Winpoint Partners, and the, I love this one, Ontario, and Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, which raised over a billion in the loan market on Tuesday, in part to fund a $388 million payment to its owners according to Moody's. You see what I'm talking about? Is that what you want to own in your portfolio? Because there's a lot more examples of that. So you have to really ask yourself, how does this benefit me? Because bonds that offer juicy interest rates of 5%, 5%, when I first became a stockbroker back in 1986, 10-year treasuries were paying something like 8%, maybe even 12%. I, one of the best deals that I ever did was, because uh, that's when I got into currencies, was like the year later, but they were New Zealand bonds that were issued by McDonald's, five-year bonds, AAA rated five-year bonds. Now, I wouldn't do a McDonald's bond now because I know too much. However, back in 1986, 12% coupon. Then there were currency issues. It was, it was fabulous. 
because the dollar became a lot stronger against the, um, the New Zealand dollar. And so we ended up, by the time they made the deposit of the dividends and then it translated into dollars, we were getting 25% on a five-year AAA rated paper. But the coupon, and the point is, the coupon was 12%. Now, you've got absolute garbage, 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 and you're thrilled to get 5%. Because you're getting under 1% in a treasury. And the only reason why they say that government bonds are the safest thing you can do is because they can tax you and they can create new money to pay you. But we know 100%, a bazillion percent, we know that the more money, new money that these central banks create, the less money that had, the less value, purchasing power value that that money has. So by the time presuming, presuming they don't go belly up, which is really presumptive, but let's say they don't. What's the value of all those dollars if we keep bailing them out? Do you see why I'm saying, without any doubt in my mind, we have hyperinflation in our future that will become visible. We already have it. It's in all the markets. And hey, look at the food prices. Now they can blame it on COVID, but the reality is it's their failed policies. And I, I wish I could say that COVID was just a accident, but I, mm, 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 mm. it's not, it's not what I think. And I can't lie to you about what I think. You get to disagree with me, but I have to tell you what I think because of all my research. So that's fine. Do that in retirement plans. I think that's a great idea. I'm being completely facetious, but here's another one. So we're going to shift a little bit. Leveraged ETP popularity rises gambling risk, experts warn. Okay, what's an ETP? It stands for exchange traded product. So you hear all the time about ETFs. Well, an ETF is actually an ETP. An ETF stands for exchange traded fund. So it's a group of stocks or something like that. So just make no mistake, when you see ETP, you can, all, I mean, there's also ETNs, which are exchange traded notes, et cetera. But it is that the ETP is a blanket for all of these Wall Street financially innovated products that they can sucker you and me into buying. Well, not me and hopefully not you, but there are a lot of people that they do. And you can see since 2007, with the growth of the ETFs and the ETPs. So once that big derivative bubble burst in 2007, 2008, then people shifted to non-managed products. But what do we know about ETFs? They don't need to carry any cash for redemptions because they're a different structure. So the entities that would be holding the bag if there was a run would be whoever sold that to you or whoever the administrator is. Like a JP Morgan, which, oh, let's see. Ah, they're too big to fail, aren't they? But I wanna go into this because these are all full years. This is just for three quarters and it's already well above all other years going down in 2007. This is a new product. These products, these ETPs, have not yet been tested. I could be wrong, but my bet is that they will fail. Because the other thing that I want to point out to you, we saw the markets went down like 2,000 points last week. Why? Because those big companies, the Fangs, the Apples, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Mo um, not Motorola, um, Bill Gates, 
You guys know what I'm talking about at any rate. Okay. All of these ETFs that are non-managed, right? We've I've done videos on this. They pile into these individual stocks in a, and it creates a herding mentality, which is a whole lot of fun when it goes up, not so much fun when it goes down. So it's not like a broad-based market rally. It's a very selective rally. It has not yet been tested. We've gotten little tastes, but then what have the central banks done? They've run in with more new money to keep it boosted. At some point, when it gets too expensive to boost, guess what happens? They don't boost it. So when everything is in place for them, you know what's going to happen. It's going to be too expensive. I can't guarantee you a lot of things, but I'll guarantee you that one. Absolutely, I'll put my neck on the line for that one. Because this whole rise in these leverage, leverage means debt upon debt upon debt upon debt upon debt. That's leverage. That's what derivatives are all about. It's just debt upon debt upon debt upon debt. And so the concern is that losses will be amplified. Yeah, think? Yeah, I think so. And so, and they know this too. Absolutely. It's almost certain that you have got a number of people using these products who don't know effectively what they are doing. The payoff strategies of these products can be very strange. I don't know whether or not this woman is, is listening to this. I hope that she is. Many years ago when I took care of clients, I looked at an annuity for this woman and it was a substantial amount. And it was all in similar garbage to this. Now, it was guaranteed by the insurance company whose guarantee is only as good as their claims paying ability. But the garbage, the sheer garbage in this variable annuity tied to this, to this formula, I mean to tell you, I was, and if she's still holding that, scared to death for this woman's retirement. Scared to death. And if you're watching, you know who I'm talking about. And I hope you're watching. Because it's just garbage upon garbage upon garbage until it gets tested. That's why they can't allow this test. That's why you see so much money being shoved into this system. Because they know that everything, when, this, when the big test comes, it will fail. And I want you to remember, March is not that long ago where there was a run on the banks and there was a run on the money markets. We're going to talk about that in a second. And what did the central bankers do? Neil Cash Carey on, was it, it wasn't CNBC, but it was like one of those PBS or one of those shows. <laughs> well, this is not a problem. We'll just print a whole lot more money, which is exactly what they did. So that everybody would go, oh, okay, okay, I, I can get my money back. It, it must be okay. It's not okay. In Zimbabwe, you can be a billionaire and you can't buy an egg. It's not okay. It's not real. How many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? So what do they say to do? It's best to avoid these funds altogether. They are only designed for a one-day holding period and making a bet over that horizon is no different than going to a casino. But hey, these can be in your retirement plan and you wouldn't even know. So I'm going to tell you, if you are still sitting in a 401k or 403b, and some people have absolutely no choice, especially if you're in a 403b and you're still working, you need to read the prospectus and you need to get your wealth protected. And you need to do that with an undervalued real asset that is a long-term positive trend. 
And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Because we know this. History always repeats itself. And it really is never different. And that goes to the strategy that I created for myself that everybody at ITM utilizes for their clients, but tweaked and customized. Because it's all about repeatable patterns. It repeats. And what I just showed you on those ETFs, US SEC which is the Securities Exchange Commission, and by the way, is not a government agency. It is really just a group of the same guys that create all of this garbage and all of this mess. But they open the door to more leveraged ETFs that we were just talking about. For your IRAs, for your 401ks, or just for your, I don't know, hard to say, investing pleasure. I don't know why anybody would, would want this garbage. Pre-clearance requirement has been removed for ETFs using up to two times leverage. So if you just have debt upon debt, yeah, you don't need to really look at it. It's okay. The retail investor is certainly sophisticated enough to judge whether or not they want to take that risk. Oh my God. Even the SEC commissioners couldn't decide on this. U.S. regulators have previously issued repeated warnings that leveraged and inverse ETFs are not suitable products for retail investors because these funds, which use derivatives to multiply returns, remember, leverage upon leverage, can generate unexpectedly large losses. You think? Retail investors, and by the way, a lot of these protections were put in through Dodd-Frank and again in 2012, and we've had a whole rash of deregulations, especially since, you know, we've had a lot of, since Dodd-Frank, well, it never even really fully went into effect. They were still writing a lot of the laws, but it's been dismantled. Retail investors and even investment professionals often do not understand the risks involved in holding leveraged and inverse ETFs. What's an inverse ETF? I don't think I explained that. Okay, well, an inverse ETF would mean that if, the, if you were betting on the market going up and it went down, that's an inverse ETF. If you're betting on the market going down and it went up, so it, the value of that ETF is going to be uh, the current market value, I should say, of that ETF is going to be impacted not only by that leverage, but by the movement in the market up or down. For periods exceeding the fund's relevant time horizon, which is typically one day. Now, look, when I read especially these, well, these, this whole group of articles. Immediately what I thought about were those two Bear Stearns funds, which I remember reading and watching this entire debacle, okay? Now, two Bear Stearns funds are almost worthless. They were worth something like, don't hold me to that because I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, one, but they were both worth somewhere in the vicinity of $6.2, $6.4 billion. That's how much the market said they were worth, how much in retail investors had put the money in. But, and I want, I want you to hear their names, because whenever anything is named a certain way, you got to know it's just the opposite. Okay, Enhanced Leveraged Fund and High Grade Fund. Uh, so what happened to them? Well, preliminary estimates show there is effectively no value left for the investors. Roughly anticipated about nine cents on the dollar. And last week, how I showed you how investors were getting back on bond deals like JPC Penny and Neiman Marcus, 
like a penny and a half to three cents on the dollar. So this is when there were still some little level of protections. Now there's less. But when I was reading this, this is exactly what I was reminded of. And, and they kept, the investors, the retail investors were being told, everything is fine, everything is fine, everything is fine. 24 hours, I'm not exaggerating, it's what then kicked off the series of the events that led to Lehman. 24 hours, bam, gone. But it was fine. It was fine up to there. So you got to wonder if they're loosening all of these regulations, and I've shown you a lot of them over the years, really, where are they tightening? And you got to see this. Wait until you see this. Okay, well, we talk about money markets a lot because they pay a little bit more interest than, a, than an insured account, of which, of course, there's not very much in there to insure the deposits. But okay, okay. Investors are flocking to money markets at the highest rate since the financial crisis. I think this is quite interesting because this is back in October. This, this article came out October 12, 2019. And in September, the money markets were imploding and the Federal Reserve went in and pumped a whole bunch of cash into it because the banks stopped lending to the hedge funds. But here's the thing. You're putting your money in the money markets. It's your money that's actually going there, except that the banks are using it because they can hypothecate it for their benefits. So the thing is, is once this money goes in and it's removed, you have a crisis. It's not there to be used, is it? And it doesn't matter that your perception is, is that you have money in money markets, by the way, because legally... You don't. Investors are flocking to the relative safety of money market funds at the highest level since the financial crisis collapsed. And then in March, Federal Reserve to backstop money market mutual funds amid coronavirus because there was a flipping run on the money markets. There was a run. I love this one. Fed signals prime money market funds need stiffer rules. So they're loosening up the rules for investors to take more risk so that private equity and other hedge funds and other banks that are doing all this derivative garbage, they're too big to fail. Kind of reminds me of the Hotel California. You can get at, in but you may never leave. And that really is, it's not my concern, will these markets keep going up? Of course they will. Because the central banks are going to keep creating this funny money to keep this propped up until it gets too expensive. Until they have everything in place that they just have you by the cojones. That's why you need physical gold and silver, because that prevents them from having you completely by the cojones. We can't avoid it entirely, but we can avoid a lot of it, and we can certainly avoid this. The Financial Stability Board, that's who the FSB is, is examining whether post-crisis reforms fell short. And remember, it was that uh, prime money market fund that broke the buck. In other words, the shares fell below a dollar share. And so then they changed all of the laws re around money markets and put in fees and gates. And they, and they said it in the documents, because I remember I went, I went all the way through this, that they needed to make the fees onerous enough to discourage people wanting to pull their money out. And now they're saying, yeah, well, maybe that wasn't enough. Maybe that wasn't enough. The runs on prime money funds and commercial paper were particularly disappointing. It is worth asking whether there may be other steps needed to secure these very important sources of liquidity. 
Welcome to the Hotel California. And it's hard because everybody always asks, well, what can we do? What are our options? Well, frankly, if you hold your wealth in the fiat money markets, you just don't have very many options. You just don't. I'm sorry. I really wish I could say something different. That's why I don't own any of that garbage. None of it. I don't own any stocks. I don't own any bonds. I don't own any CDs. I have probably at the moment more than I'd like to in the bank because I have a business. So there are some things we don't have any choice about. But whatever... I might possibly have in the fiat money markets, which is not really all that much. It needs to be protected. A hundred percent, it needs to be protected. And Wall Street wants you to protect it with contracts on gold and on silver, which is garbage because it's cheap. It's, it's nothing to manipulate those. Seriously, 150 bucks. 500 ounces of gold, 5,000 ounces of silver. Big deal. But even so, this is just from the beginning of the year. Real investors own physical metals. China, Russia, India. They don't want to be part of the U.S. SWIFT system, the dollar system. They've been divesting dollars, divesting treasuries, buying physical gold. Me too. I don't like dollars. I don't have much choice because I have to use them as my tool of barter. But I do have choices on where I hold my savings and where I prepare for my retirement. And you have that same choice. And you have to make that choice. Because we have choice until we don't. And I promise you, you will not get a phone call saying, uh, by the way, we're not going to support the markets on Tuesday. That's it. It's game over. Nobody's going to know. We're all going to be shocked, including me. But just like I did in March and April when I'm walking around my farm going, I have plenty of food to eat, I have plenty to share. I can be a benefit to my community. When that happens, it's going to be the same thing. I'm going to go, thank goodness I did what I did. Thank goodness. Now I can be of benefit and I can help. We all have to figure out what that's going to look like because you do have a choice even though they don't want you to think you have a choice is this really where you want to hold your wealth for retirement with all of the garbage that's going on with it or is in something real that you hold and you own outright no counterparty risk Let's de-risk. Let's de-risk. So I'm hoping that you really will share this video with anybody that you know and love that's sitting in these markets. Because a hundred bazillion percent, get your assets covered. Please. Please. Things are so precarious right now. They're not going to get less precarious, no matter who ends up in the White House. It's too late. And that's not who's driving the bus. It's the central bankers. And they have been doing a really great job for the haves, but a crappy, crappy, crappy job for the have-nots. And when people are hungry and hopeless, they make choices they otherwise wouldn't. And that's why it's so important to make sure that you and your family have food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter.
And in the shield, we talk about sustainability. We talk about wealth preservation, which if you have money in these markets and you can't pull it out, that is a big, huge key for you. Huge, huge, huge. But you also, the opportunities that will present, remember, mortgage and rent moratoriums go away the end of December. Now, I'm not saying they can't elongate them, but that is just a snowball too because there's so many securities that are depending upon that income. So, you know, we're, we've hit the limits. We've absolutely hit the limits. Get this done as quickly as possible. Then you can just relax. We're going into holiday season. You won't have to worry about anything. So this week, actually on Thursday, I'm going to be on with Brian and Daryl over at As Good As Gold in Australia. And, you know, they really ask some of the best questions. And I enjoyed my interview that I did with them so much before. I'm 100% certain this is going to be phenomenal too. And next week, I'll be with my good friend, Dustin Nemos, who really is my favorite millennial, no doubt about it. So, uh, and he always asks a good question. And frankly, he gives me a lot of hope because it's not my generation that's going to make the biggest difference. It's his generation that is. So if you want to talk to one of our consultants, just click that Calendly link below and set up a time to meet. Then of course, if a time that you want isn't available, don't give up. We like human contact. So just call us 888-696 four, six, five, three, and set up a time that works for you. And of course, and this is so important, and I think we've got more that are coming on board. It's also posted on Facebook and Brighteon. And is there another one that it's being posted on now, Dylan? Library. And it's also being posted on library. So we want to, we've got three extra places because what happened with Sean at SGT, frankly, makes me a bit nervous. But if you have any questions about this or anything else, just send them to questions at itmtrading.com. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up and make sure that you subscribe. Just hit that little bell. We'll let you know when we're coming on. But, you know, as always, we've got lots of things coming up this week. And I really hope that you will be very, very careful out there. And until tomorrow, bye-bye.